Uh, artificial intelligence has really been heralded as the next uh, big industrial revolution. Um, uh, you know, we think about the 18th century and, and the coming of steam power and, uh, and then the onset of the Industrial Revolution uh, and then uh, mass production coming in the, in the 1800s and 1900s, uh, this, next wave, uh, uh, this next wave of production. And then, of course, over the last uh, 50, 60 years, the introduction of personal computers and, uh, and the Internet and our ability now to uh, collect and to uh, transmit knowledge in a ways we never could before. And many people believe now that artificial intelligence and machine learning are going to be really, uh, we're just at the very, very tip in the beginning of this next incredible wave of capabilities. So artificial intelligence uh, is, is, when, is when machines um, machines do things that seem smart. So think about a computer that plays checkers. You know, that's, that's, you could teach a computer to play checkers by putting the rules of checkers into a computer, and the computer can play checkers and sometimes win and sometimes lose. Uh, chess was a big, interesting computer problem for a long time, and how do you get a computer to win at chess? And for a long time, um, People tried to program computers to, uh, uh, with the rules of chess, and computers just weren't powerful enough to think ahead 20, 30 moves, and so the humans were uh, able to beat computers for a long time at chess until, um, uh, uh, until computers became powerful enough to, to beat humans. And interestingly enough, it, it, what, there wasn't any magic in what we told the computers on how to beat a human at chess. Um, it, it was just a matter of how far into the game a, a human could think. So, he, so the masters could think 17, 18 moves into a game. And once computers were able to play out all the possibilities from each move, um, they were able to beat humans. And I'm going to talk a bit about the game Go in a little bit, and, and, there, and we'll talk about the differences between chess and Go and why that was a much harder problem. People tend to lump in machine learning and artificial intelligence together, and they're a little bit different. So machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. In machine learning, you don't necessarily tell the machine, you don't tell the computer all the rules. Uh, you let the machine do some learning for itself. And uh, so a good example is your, your spam filter. So one way to teach a computer how to know what spam is, is you, you give the computer a uh, couple million emails and say, hey, these emails are spam. And you say, these emails are not spam. And you have the computer uh, uh, use different machine learning algorithms to figure out a set of rules so that when new email comes in, the computer can split them up. Uh, and then the newest wave now is something called deep learning. And deep learning goes beyond this. We're not, you, not only do you use these, um, these methods of decision trees and other things to, to help the computer learn, you actually have something called a neural network, which is this uh, almost this opaque layer inside the computer that learns from different, from different examples, but you can't really tell why the computer is learning to do what it does. And so this is in some ways very scary. Uh, because computers making predictions that are really good, but for reasons you're not sure why. And as we talk about some of the ethical and uh, moral implications of doing this in medicine and healthcare and other areas, uh, we should think about that as one of the interesting reasons why it's um, why it's uh, difficult. The ethics are difficult is because we don't always know why the computer is telling us to what it's doing. Okay, so with that background, uh, a little bit about uh, I'm going to give you some examples. So. Go is a really simple game. It's a simple game to learn the rules. Uh, it has to do with, with using these little tiles to surround other pieces. And the interesting thing about Go uh, compared to chess is that even with that simple set of rules, the number of possible moves that can happen at any one point is, is enormous. In fact, uh, uh, I think the thing I read said that the number of possible moves at any one time is more than the number of atoms in the universe. So for a long time, uh, people thought that computers would never beat the masters at Go. It was just too difficult. There's, t there's too much intuition involved. Um, you can't teach a computer these types of rules. You couldn't feed the computer all the possible games, so it couldn't learn that way. Uh, and so uh, Google did an interesting thing. They uh, used a, a deep neural network, uh, which is one of this, these, these deep learning techniques. And instead of telling the computer, um, giving the computer lots of games, they basically just gave the computer the rules and said, here are the rules to the game, and here's what it looks like when you win. And then they let the computer play itself. And they let the computer play itself over and over again. And every time the computer played itself, its deep neural network learned a little bit more about what was a smart move and what wasn't a smart move. And what happened is in the beginning, it had no prior knowledge of how to play Go. And on the y-axis is, is, uh, is the ranking of how good the computer is. By three days, the computer had actually passed one of the world masters in ability. Uh, and over the, next, um, uh, over the next 25 days or so, or 20 days or so, it reached the level of world master. 
And uh, this, this uh, uh, documentary uh, um, about the AlphaGo that's on uh, Netflix is an amazing documentary to watch because it, it, it's, a, it's both at once uh, exhilarating to see computers do this, and in some ways it's actually sort of sad because uh, you see these folks who thought that the computers would never win this game, and you see the, what, what occurs to them as this is happening, how the world has really changed. One of the other interesting things about, um, about this, this game that was, uh, I think was really fun and has a lot of implications for healthcare uh, is that at one point the computer made a move and everybody thought the computer went crazy. It was a move deep in the middle of one of the games and everybody watching it said, well, the computer is obviously screwed up. It made this ridiculous move uh, back to the drawing board. And as the game went on, it became clear that this move the computer made, nobody had ever seen a move like this and yet it was part of the path that this computer was taking on the way to beating the master. And so here's a game that had been played for 3,000 years, and there was something that was to be learned by watching the computer play the game. And as we think about using AI in uh, medicine, uh, how are we going to approach these situations where the AI tells you to do something, and you're like, I would never do that in that instance. And do you look at that and say, that's a mistake, or is that a really smart thing to do? Um, AI powers autonomous vehicles. Uh, kids born today are highly unlikely to ever need their driver's license. I think most people agree that uh, within, a, within a few short years we're going to be uh, uh, driven around by autonomous vehicles. Uh, uh, the artificial intelligence algorithms that we've talked about so far are the same algorithms that power autonomous vehicles and help you do the image detection. Um, does anybody know what the trolley problem is? I see a lot of, a lot of heads nodding. Uh, and so uh, the trolley problem is a famous ethics problem or morals problem where uh, trolley's coming down the track and it's, if, you do the, if this person here at the switch does nothing, these, um, uh, these five people get killed and if uh, he pulls the switch, the, the trolley diverts and kills this one person and the question is, should that person, what's the ethical thing to do? Should that person pull the switch? Obviously there's no right answer to that question, but as we think about uh, autonomous driving cars, if your autonomous car is driving down the street and it's headed toward a group of people and the car can, through its algorithms, know if it swerves, it'll just hit one person, should it do that? I think we could argue the merits of that, but I think the, the scary part is if your car is driving down the street and it could swerve to avoid hitting people and then it kills you because it crashes into a wall, should your car do that or not? And should you have the right as the owner to override whatever algorithms are in there and make that decision? So these, um, these implications are going to be coming uh, not just for uh, self-driving cars, but all through areas that where we're going to rely on computers and healthcare being a really important, uh, important player. Uh, rec image recognition is just incredible now, and I'm going to show you an example or two, but over the last three years, the ability for Google to recognize images and pictures has now exceeded what humans could recognize. And, um, and I use Google Photos a lot for my pictures. I stopped, and I'm so, let me just say I'm so glad I didn't spend hours and hours in the 90s and 2000s tagging all my photos, because it's almost, you almost don't have to do that anymore. It's incredible the way Google can see in pictures. In fact, the other day, um, where I was looking for a picture of a friend, and I put his name into the Google search bar uh, for my photos, and a picture came up, and I'm like, he's not in this picture. And it was, a, it was a picture from my wedding, and I zoomed in on the picture, and there he was in the shadows and the crowd watching what we were doing at the wedding. And I was like, Google found his face in that photo from 30 years ago in a scanned image. It's really incredible. Um, and the way that image recognition works is through these deep neural networks. And the way a neural network, um, the way to think about it is that uh, neurons are composed of these axons and these dendrites coming off and they transmit electrical signals. And uh, if you uh, program a computer in a similar way where you have, um, where you're able to take in a signal, in this case, say a picture or a sound, and you're able to, uh, able to turn that into some sort of output that can be modulated, you have what's called a neural network. And as I mentioned before, in a neural network, you can't really tell what's going on down here. All you can do is you can put things in the beginning and say, okay, this picture here, I'm gonna caption it, a cute little dog sitting in a heart on a sandy beach, or I'm gonna caption this, a dog walking next to a little dog on a beach. And if you do that millions of times, and this network keeps retraining itself, eventually you can feed it a picture like this and it will put out a dog sitting on the beach next to a dog. And this is a real capability that exists today and this is what powers Google Photos and many other types of image recognition services. 
this is a great example of the power of doing this, and this is a true story. So we were sitting around one day, uh, and, and, and um, uh, I was trying to find a picture where we had put our kids inside a dog cage at, um, at, at my parents' house. And I remembered us doing this, and I thought, I have to find this picture. That would be so funny. And so I'm asking her, when was that? Was that when we were in for Thanksgiving? What year was that? Is that when we were living in Boston? Like, we could not remember anything about it. And I said, okay, I went to Google's photos, and I typed in dog cage. Uh, and within, one, within, um, uh, within uh, a couple seconds, it popped right up. Now, how long would it have, I have about 150,000 pictures on Google Photos, and how long would it have taken me to troll through and try to figure out where that picture is? It's, it's an incredible capability, and this is a, obviously a, a very lighthearted application of it, but it's an incredible ability that's now sweeping through healthcare, and I'll show you some medical examples of that in a few minutes. Here's another uh, interesting uh, application of photo recognition. So it's a, a, picture of my wife, um, a picture of my wife and me in Malibu, and I put this through a... Uh, uh, emotion recognition, and although I think we both look plenty happy, she of course is 100% happy, everything else is zero, and, and for some reason um, it does not, it doesn't really seem to understand my facial expressions and I have a few other emotions I'm not proud of. So this is a real tool now that Bing has on their website and you can upload a photo to Bing and it will do this analysis for you. And uh, at South by Southwest, I saw an example where um, they had a mock store set up, and as you walked around the store, uh, a, a thing was constantly evaluating your emotion on your face as you were looking at products, and it was telling, uh, telling you what the emotions were of the person looking at the product. So this is an incredible tool that can now be used in real time. Okay, so the same uh, machine learning tech that is driving all these other things is now really pushing into healthcare in a big way. And I'm not going to go through all these examples, but this is an enormous industry, it's touching all areas of healthcare, and it's going to have enormous impact going forward in how we take care of patients. So this is uh, an example of um, looking at skin cancer. Uh, so this is a study that Google did where they looked at, um, I think it was over 100,000 of these uh, skin cancer lesions. Uh, they had a dermatologist grade them, they taught the neural network using the graded images, and then when they fed the, uh, fed the um, algorithm Un, uh, unlabeled images, it was able with very high fidelity to diagnose skin cancer from normal, uh, from, from normal uh, birthmarks. Really amazing application of, of this technology. Uh, here is a, another look. Uh, this is a slide looking for cancer. And normally what a pathologist will do is they will use a special stain on this slide to look for where the cancer is. And so they'll put a stain on top, takes a couple days, uh, the stain will bind to certain uh, surface factors, and if it comes back uh, as a certain color, they'll know there's cancer there. So what they did is they trained, they showed, um, they showed the computer lots of examples of the slide, both unstained and stained, and they told the computer where the cancer was, and, they, and the computer learned how to diagnose cancer from the stains, like a pathologist would. But something else really cool happened. Eventually, the computer was actually able to find cancer on the slides without the stains something that a pathologist could not reliably tell from looking at the image. So there's some things in this image that are too subtle for the human eye that the computer can even pick up on. And so imagine now, instead of having to wait three days for special stains to come back, you could find cancer within a few minutes using a, an image algorithm like this. So everybody always asks, well, are, should all the pathologists go out of business? You know, what's, what's going to happen to the pathologists and radiologists? And I think that we're a long way from that. Uh, the way that I like to think about it uh, is looking at data like this that shows that pathologists, of course, have an error rate where they make mistakes uh, at, a, at a rate, you know, somewhere under 5%. And the computer is better. The computer makes less mistakes. But when you use the two together, the error rate goes down uh, a lot. And so I think this is where the true power of this technology is going to lie, is, is in radiologists, pathologists, and other physicians using um, artificial intelligence to uh, help aid their diagnosis and free up their time to do more creative things uh, and help, uh, to help do more um, discovery and help work cl more closely with patients. So I think this is, these are going to be important tools and I think people should still not be afraid of going into pathology or radiology if they want to. Uh, this is exciting work from Mary Ellen Geiger's group here at the University of Chicago. So uh, she studies how to take a look at uh, breast cancer images and from just the image can you determine whether it's a cancerous, uh, cancerous lesion or not? Uh, and so she's built a whole set of machine learning algorithms, just like the ones that uh, Google was using on those uh, skin cancer pictures. And now she has a, a, a tool, a commercialized tool, actually, that can actually look at lesions and can predict with some degree of certainty whether they're cancerous or not. 
Uh, this was a, a paper from Google from about two years ago. Um, this is a paper that only Google could do. So they, they, they're very interested in um, diabetic retinopathy, which is the number one cause of blindness in the world. And in third world countries, they don't have access to retinologists to look at people's eyes on a regular basis to tell if they're um, developing diabetic retinopathy. So they thought this would be a great application for artificial intelligence, because what if you could just take a picture of somebody's eyes uh, and then have a computer do a first pass screen to see if the person has diabetic retinopathy. So Google uh, uh, took 110,000 images and they paid uh, ophthalmologists to review those images and to score them. And that's what I mean. This was not a cheap study to do, right? And they were able to uh, feed the computer over 100,000 of these images, get the scores, and then train their algorithm to a point where the computer now can diagnose retinopathy on these pictures at a level better than an expert ophthalmologist can. And so now, this is um, Lily Peng's work from uh, two or three years ago. I think now they're actually starting to roll this out, uh, in, roll this out into third world countries as a way to screen patients. Uh, so we've actually done, you know, uh, close to home. This is work that we're doing that's similar, uh, but it's in, the, it's in the area of predicting cardiac arrest. So this is work that Matt Sherpeck and Don Edelson have, have done at University of Chicago. They used our clinical research data warehouse to get data on patients, and they said, um, they thought, uh, we know that patients who have a cardiac arrest and code will warn us beforehand. And the further back in time you can get warned about that, the more likely you can intervene and help save the patient. Because once you're having a cardiac arrest, your chance of survival is very low. So what they did is they used our warehouse to collect data on uh, 50,000 or so, uh, 60,000 patients, and we collected tons of data on uh, heart rate and respiratory rate and some labs, and they built an algorithm that can actually give you a warning sign up to eight hours in advance if somebody is sliding downhill and going to have a cardiac arrest. And now they've implemented this algorithm in the hospital, and so now there's a code team that wears a pa I'm embarrassed to say they wear pagers, but they, they get alerted in advance if a patient is starting to have signs of uh, impending cardiac arrest, and they go to the patient's room, and the patient's usually actually appearing quite fine at that point, but they look at the algorithm and say, here are the reasons we think that you're getting sicker. Now remember, before when I talked about deep learning, I said one of the problems is that you can't always look at the algorithm and know why. The algorithm that Matt and Donna have built does not use deep learning. It uses regular machine learning, meaning that it, they can tell the computer can say, I think this patient is getting sick because of these factors, and it helps people intervene. If we were just using a deep learning model, all the computer could really tell you is, hey, I think the patient's sick. You should try to figure out why. So this is a real uh, application. It's working. It's uh, evidence shows that it's starting to save lives. Um, we then took this and, and wanted to see, um, could we even uh, predict something more interesting, at least to me, which is if one patient gets sick, uh, what about the patients around that person? So can you, are you at risk in the hospital just by virtue of being near somebody who's sick? Not because you're gonna catch what they have, but because of the diversion of resources or because people are ignoring you or because that's, everything's crazy on the floor. So we did something similar. We, uh, we took 80,000 admissions over five years uh, data over all the hospital, and we found 4,500 times when somebody had a cardiac arrest or got transferred to the ICU. And we said during that time, was there uh, a six hour period if we looked, did patients around them have an increased risk of having an event themselves? And what we found is that sure enough, uh, if you have, if there's a one patient on your ward in the hospital that has a cardiac arrest, your own risk of having a cardiac arrest yourself goes up 20%. And if there's two patients on your ward, your risk goes up 50%. Now, why that is, we don't know. You know, there's a lot of reasons we could speculate because maybe all the nurses are in that other patient's room and they're ignoring you. Uh, maybe it's because uh, people are handing off patients because they need to switch patients and take somebody to the ICU. Uh, but the effect is definitely there. And this is a really interesting application of using machine learning to try to tease out how we can improve care. Um, and so we got a couple nice write-ups on this. Some uh, other groups called it a domino effect. Uh, I like the term contagious risk. I was told that was a little bit too, um, uh, a little bit too out there to put into a paper title. So I think we, I forget what we, we called it, neighborhood effect. Thank you. So, uh, but I like contagious risk. Um, uh, and so all these things raise important issues about healthcare. Uh, uh, you can read a little bit more about this um, and some of the work we've been doing with Google lately. Um, there's a little write-up that Andrew Burt and I did that was in the Harvard Business Review a couple weeks ago, which goes through some of the issues around. Um, you know, if, you're, if a doctor is presented with um, 
uh, an algorithm that says, hey, this patient here is going to uh, have a high chance of dying in the next 48 hours. Um, how should the doctors use that information? How should the patients believe that information? Um, uh, does the doctor have to use that information? What are the ethical implications of, of doing this? And what are the implications of us not really knowing why these recommendations are being made? You know, is it okay that, uh, is it okay that we take the computer's recommendation without knowing the reasons why? Um, there are some people that think we shouldn't do that. Um, I happen to think that we should, but it's an interesting, it's an interesting argument. So let's move outside of the hospital a little bit um, uh, and talk about some other areas in which we're using data to, to help, um, to help uh, learn and, and study and perhaps make healthcare better. So wearables, of course, are an exploding area. Um, who's, who's tracking themselves somehow with a phone or a watch or a wearable? Um, you know, we live in this, um, this uh, uh, this um, self, uh, society of, of, of self-measurement and everybody wanting to know and tell everybody else how they're doing all the time. Uh, and so there's no shortage of ways that you can measure yourself. Uh, it's not just the watches. There's little patches now. There's all sorts of sensors. There's pills you can swallow that will monitor what you've eaten and what, you, what you've taken. Um, there's uh, uh, ways to measure how you're going to the bathroom. There's amazing new ways to keep track of every little bit of our, uh, of our, of our health. Uh, and so these data now are starting to flow in, and the question is, how are we going to use these data, and how are they going to uh, impact our healthcare? Um, wearables data, um, uh, the most common way that we use it is for uh, tracking exercise. Uh, I don't know if you saw this story from, uh, from last year where um, people are using these, um, these tracking devices now to automatically upload their running routes. So Strava, for instance, is an important program where people automatically, I didn't even know I had this turned on, and I went for a run last week, and somebody wrote me and said, congratulations on your run, and I didn't even know that I had this upload functionality turned on, and it turned out that they were able to see my run in their Strava program. <laughs> if I had known that, I would have run faster. <laughs> but this was an important, um, uh, an important thing, because uh, uh, the, the, these folks here were actually running on an army base, and they also didn't know that their data were being uploaded automatically. And so now, all of a sudden, you were able to see the outline and shape of a top secret army base because the folks in the service were wearing these watches and they were uploading their data when they were running. So here's an implication that maybe they, we should have seen, but we didn't. Uh, and so here's a, uh, an actual security implication of having these data tracked and, and automatically uploaded. But I'm very passionate about wearables data. I think it's an incredible area. I think we're going to be doing all sorts of stuff around uh, disease prediction and modeling based on uh, watching people's heart rate and how they sleep and what their step counts are. And I think we're going to be able to combine that with other data to actually make some really cool predictions about how people are doing and what their risks are for, um, for having, um, having flares of disease and other problems. Um, we get asked a lot about social networking data and how we're going to be using that. Um, this is a little piece from last year that we put in Wired that, um, that talked about, uh, you know, can, what if Facebook could actually tell somebody that they were sick before they knew it? And that may seem far-fetched, but, but think about it. Let's say that somebody uh, had some early signs of uh, a brain tumor, for instance, and they're on Facebook chatting with their friend. They say, you know what? I woke up this morning and I was really nauseated and then I vomited and then I felt better. Uh, and that's been happening over the last couple of days and I've had some really bad headaches. I think it's just stress. Uh, you know, if you, if, you, um, if you think about it, there's a lot of clues that people are typing into their computer in these various Facebook groups. And it's not limited to Facebook, you know, in, the, in, their, in their Twitter or Instagram. Uh, there's a lot of clues that a patient could be getting sick. And the question is, if these networks can do this, if they can warn people, should they? I think it's an interesting question. And we can talk about it in the discussion because there's obviously no right answer, but uh, there's going to be a lot of potential here for um, for these for these incredibly large amounts uh, these uh, these companies that collect these large amounts of data to help make predictions for us like this. Um, one of the downsides, obviously, is going to be a lot of false positives. You know, you're going to have uh, you know, where do you set that, tune, that, that tuning dial? Do you want 100 people to run to the doctor with headaches uh, to find the one person with a brain tumor? Maybe that's too many. Maybe we'll do 50-50. Or where do you set that? And how do you decide when you're making an ethical decision about telling somebody they might be sick? Uh, of course, there's um, obviously issues with uh, too much data. This was a famous case from a few years ago where um, 
uh, Target was able to use uh, tracking by what people bought, and they found that if, if, if uh, young women were buying unscented lotions and a few other things, they were able to predict with some degree of certainty that the woman was pregnant. Uh, and this father brought this case forward because he had a teenage daughter living in the house, started getting all these pregnancy things from Target, and, um, and that's how he found out that his daughter was pregnant. Um, so, that, so that is an interesting implication of Target owning our data and having access to this personal information about us and what they're able to do. So you could see the positive value of, of being able to predict these things, but there's also a, a negative downside. And one of the interesting uh, follow-ups from this um, episode was that uh, somebody brought up the point that it's not really, like the fact that Target might know you're pregnant is um, creepy, but it's not as bad as, um, as say, the TSA thinking you should be on the no-fly list when you really shouldn't be. And if you think about the implications of getting labeled something that you're not because some algorithm in some opaque way has decided that you should be on the do not fly list and you unable to figure out why you're on that list and get off that list, I think that's much worse. And so I think that's the real, the real ethical question around these things is um, if these algorithms are really going to be opaque and we're going to let them make decisions for us, uh, what right do we have to understand the algorithm and what right do we have to try to, um, to, try to get ourselves off these lists or to, impact the, to, to have an effect on the impact they have. Uh, so just to sort of close out before we go to our questions, you know, think about the, the, the digital exhaust we leave everywhere. Uh, and you're probably thinking, yeah, well, it's probably just my Facebook and maybe my YouTube history. It's a lot more than that. If you think about the, if you think about the uh, amount of information that we leave about ourselves everywhere we go, it is truly startling. Uh, Google actually will let you have complete insight into what they're collecting on you. And it's really interesting to go do this, to look at what Google has on you. They have, um, they have information on where you've been, they have information on, uh, on your map coordinates, on your pictures, uh, on your, all of your search history, your internet search, uh, search history, everything you've looked up on YouTube. There's a reasonable expectation that Google knows all this about you. And I think in some ways you can embrace this, right? So I got back from a, a, a trip um, to Amsterdam a couple months ago, and I went on Google and I saw everywhere I had been uh, on a map, and not only was it where I, where I was, it was actually telling me how I was traveling. It was, I was on a bus, I was on a plane, I was walking. And on the right side, it actually had my pictures that I took with my cell phone there um, actually tied up with the time and place I was at. It was incredible. And, and so I wasn't creeped out by that. I knew Google was doing this. Uh, but um, I think for many people, that is actually quite a frightening um, thought that Google knows all these things about them. But of course, it's not just Google. If you think about Uber and Lyft, you know, for folks that ride Uber and Lyft, in your Uber account is every time you've taken an Uber ride. Where you've been, what time it was, where it was on the GPS, how much it cost. Uh, I got an alert one morning uh, about, you know, you get the receipts the next day, and I got a, a, an email from Uber, thanks for your ride last night. And I, you know, I hadn't gone on an Uber ride, so I opened up my email, and there it was. It was four in the morning, and it was from our house to somewhere near Midway Airport. And I'm thinking, like, I didn't do this ride, but it definitely started at my house. And so I went to my teenage boys and I was like, who went on a, dr who went on a drug run last night? And you know, of course they said that they didn't do it. And so I wrote to Lyft and they took it off. And, but I'm still left wondering, like, who were they tracking? Did somebody get my account? Uh, it is sort of scary. And that, that um, you know, whether or not I took that ride or not, there it is in my, in my history of the trips that I took. So there's a lot of information we leave out there. Um, and I think the idea of whether we have privacy or not is an interesting question. Um, uh, you know, there's this illusion that we have privacy. Uh, I read one thing that talks about, this is a real, real thing, by the way. Um, I, I, I read um, one interesting thing about privacy that said, in some ways, we're more, we can be more anonymous than ever now. Like, 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 like you can protest something or you can uh, whistleblow in, in a way that you can be completely anonymous now if you know how to do that in a way that you never could before because there's ways to completely anonymize who you are when you're, when you're, when you're communicating. But on the other hand, we're completely, completely identified. And for most people in here, it's very easy to look somebody up to find their picture. Um, you know, if you've ever run, who's ever run a, a race in here, a 5K? You know, if you've run a 5K, I can go find your picture, you know, because Marathon Photo takes that $4,000 picture of you. Uh, I can find you in the list, and I can look up your time. All that stuff is out there in the public domain, uh, whether you realize it or not. And that's just one small example. Uh, this is an old cartoon, but think about how um, 
how relevant it is today, right? Um, so yeah, so I think this is a really interesting issue about whether we still have privacy and how it impacts our, our ability to communicate and to work. Um, uh, if you tried to read all the privacy policies uh, that you encounter in a year, it would take uh, a good portion of your time. I think we're all used to clicking through those iTunes license agreements and other privacy policies, and companies have an ethical and moral obligation to treat your data with, with respect and with privacy, but most companies um, also, uh, they all have a fiduciary responsibility, so I think there's a tension there that obviously we need to work through. So um, I think we'll have an interesting discussion, but the points I wanted to really make through these slides was um, AI is transforming everything, not just healthcare. Uh, and it's a coming wave that we're just at the very, very, very beginning of, and it's just going to, uh, it, it's going to take off in ways that we still can't even predict. Um, patients are going to interact with the healthcare system in, in many, way, many new ways. Uh, this whole concept of our data being siloed in a hospital or a healthcare system, it's ridiculous, right? That, that um, if you want to know what your last hemoglobin was, you have to like, call up your doctor or go to the office. I mean, it's a whole silly system we have in place where all of our data are stuck siloed. And so the, we're really going to be moving to an era where you'll have control of all of your data. And it won't just be your healthcare data. You'll have all of your data in a, pl in a place where you can integrate your Fitbit data and your Amazon purchase data. And you'll be able to control it in ways where you can say, listen, I want to send my healthcare data to this next doctor. I want her to have con uh, be able to see it for the next three months, and then I want it to expire. And I don't want to include my psychiatry notes in there. I just want my other health data, all with the click of a button. Uh, and that day is coming very soon, and this uh, giving patients agency over all of their data, I think, is going to be a real important uh, point for people taking ownership of their health care in ways they never could before. Uh, I think we're moving from this very, you know, in some ways we moved from this paternalistic society where, you know, back in the 60s, doctors would just say, here's what you should do, and you would do it, to this era in the last 10 years where we flooded patients with information. You know, here's 14 different options, you pick one. Yeah, patients didn't really want that either. They want something different, and I think we're finally moving to this era where everybody can be really invested in their own care, and they can, they can work with their healthcare providers on a peer level and share information and make decisions together. And of course, the ethical and legal issues are, are, are profound, and rather than say we need to stifle this innovation or we need to hide from these algorithms, we need to protect ourselves. There need to be laws against somebody taking your Uber history and using it against you. There need to be laws against somebody taking your genomic profile and, uh, and publishing it. Uh, so there are ways to protect people that, that, um, that aren't necessarily around uh, trying to um, squelch the innovation. Uh, I'm not a tinfoil hat person. Like, I think, we, I think we, we really should try to share our data. We should try to all be part of this like, enormous clinical trial that we're all part of together. Uh, and to do that, I think we just have to set up the right infrastructure. So most of the work, uh, a lot of the research work that went into the stuff you saw here is the group that I run, the Center for Research Informatics. Uh, we're a 40-person group here on campus that does a lot of research, uh, mostly using um, uh, clinical data uh, for, for healthcare applications, but we do all sorts of other interesting things as well. Um, and I'm going to stop there, and we have, I think, like 15, 20 minutes for questions and discussion, and knowing this crowd, I'm sure we'll have a lot of, a lot of interesting discussions. So um, anybody have a question or idea they want to bring up? Let's start right in the back there. <clears throat> a question about clinicians. Uh, many have posited that electronic health records are contributing to clinician burnout. Mm -hmm. How do you see AI helping clinicians, physicians, et cetera, uh, provide not just better care, but care that helps them uh, maintain themselves in the game for the long run. It's really interesting. So we had a really interesting speaker yesterday. Kevin Johnson came from Vanderbilt, and he addressed this exact question in his lecture. And he, uh, he gave a really interesting perspective, which is that uh, we're, we're in this um, interesting chasm right now between as we've adopted electronic health records, but we adopted them in a way that was really trying to replicate the old paper system. And the old paper system is, this, is, is not... The way, to, the way to use electronic health records was not to say, we did it on paper this way, we're going to do it electronically this way. Uh, we're going to quickly move to an, to, out of this valley to really using electronic systems in a way that are much more um, helpful to physicians and patients. So I'll give you an example. Um, it, 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 it will soon be possible to have audio and video of, of a physical exam uh, that is running during the exam, that at the end of the exam, the note and all the documentation is automatically done. 
And so when the physician looks in the patient's eyes, the video will see that. When the physician asks the patient, hey, have you quit smoking? And the patient says, yeah, I've been trying. Audio will pick all that up and the, and, and the note will be written. All of this work is actually already um, being done in small ways and, and very narrow areas. So if you have a narrow vocabulary like radiology, you can actually do this quite well. And now it's just being expanded out to other areas. So I, I really am hopeful that we're in this you know, 10, 20 year period of um, valley of despair where things are really tough and everybody complains about having to type their notes and the checking off the boxes. Uh, but I think over the next five, 10 years, we're really going to come out of this and, and it's really going to change the way that we take care of patients. It's a great question. Thank you. Right here. Uh, legal and related uh, insurance yep. issues. Since in, uh, since in the U.S., somebody uh, is usually paying um, for m much of the insurance involved, either your, you or your employer. Um, to the extent that insurance companies get all of this information that's out there, uh, what, what are the implications for, for going in, doing something, getting some measurements, and then suddenly having your insurance canceled or tripled in price? Or yeah, so I, obviously the, the worry has always been, you know, what if my genetic information gets out? Uh, you know, let's say I have... Uh, a genomic profile that says that I'm at high risk for colon cancer. Am I going to be difficult to insure? And so the genetic, um, the genetic information, it's a genie. There's a non-disclosure law that went into place that actually is supposed to protect people from those, those types of things happening. And you're talking about now something more important, which is sort of the larger issue of, uh, you know, what if my, um, you know, what if my, all of my health records get out there? What if my Amazon search history gets out there? Uh, I, again, I think, um, there's no question that these things are going to get out there, right? Um, the, the, the whole issue of trying to protect these things um, uh, is going to be very difficult. Uh, obviously, we need to take great care of people's data. We need to um, give patients autonomy over their data. But we really need the ethical and legal framework to protect people from these things. Because uh, you're absolutely right. If, if people are continually aware, continuously aware that insurance is going to discriminate against them, they're not going to share their data. And it's going to make all this moot, because it's going to make it more difficult to, to learn from our, our work. So, so I, I think it's going to happen through legislation. Um, but it's obviously an ongoing concern. It's a great question. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question, and, and I don't know a ton about the uh, dementia or Alzheimer's research space, but I was at an interesting um, talk. Uh, I, I shared the stage with a guy a few months ago where his research is about um, using uh, video games to help people that have early dementia, uh, and, and the research was interesting because this was cool. They showed that if you played this game for 15 minutes, um, right after the game, your uh, recall and your, your attention was heightened. But the cool thing was is that they showed that it worked for days afterwards, even after you did this. And so this very early work in gamification is proving out that, uh, that there are going to be ways to modify the plasticity of our, of our learning uh, um, and hopefully try to slow down this process of dementia. Now, your question about how do we actually measure somebody's uh, level of dementia and when they've sort of reached some, some boundary, I think that's going to go more toward um, understanding through these types of games uh, what are the metrics that we need to measure and what does it mean for somebody to, um, uh, to you have to measure in these very specific areas uh, where somebody is losing their ability and try to tweak those areas. So it's a great question. Um, uh, and I think uh, between the gamification and other areas of research, I'm hope hopeful that we're going to get at that question. Thank you. Way in the back. Some of these, um, some of the uh, examples you gave with the I and Go, you know, they're like real experts in fields like teaching mm -hmm. Google and the machines and deep learning how to do things, and it just takes it to another level, but it uses an expert. How important is like clean data sets in, in making these predictions? And is the machine able to correlate data sets in a way that's accurate, or is that a real risk yeah. where so, we are today? So it's a, it's, a, it's a super interesting question, and it shows um, it, it, it um, betrays a little bit that you have a you have a you have more than a passing knowledge of this area that you would ask that. So uh, you know, in the like the work we've been doing with Google, for instance, the initial pass with Google was you know the initial attraction for our group for their, our groups was we are very good at cleaning up data from the medical record. We're very good at building a database. 
Uh, we're very good at, um, at standardizing the data. And, and Google came at us early on and said, that's great, you guys. I'm so glad you're good at cleaning up data. Just give us the messy data, because we're just going to put it in our big data lake and use our deep learning algorithms, and it's going to be fine. And about six months later, they came back to us and said, this data is really hard. It's really messy. <laughs> um, and so I think, I think there was this early enthusiasm that you wouldn't need to clean the data up. It would all sort out through these deep learning techniques. But, but the medical data is really messy. And, and by messy, I mean um, the obvious things like, um, like structured data where somebody, uh, somebody puts uh, pounds instead of kilograms. So you have somebody whose weight is uh, 10 for five days in a row and it's 10 kilograms. All of a sudden it's 22. And you're like, oh, did they gain 12 kilograms? No, somebody put 22 pounds instead of 10 kilograms. So there's those kinds of cleanup that has to do with quality control. Uh, there's other kinds of messy data where um, somebody might make a data collection form where, um, uh, where you can type in a number and it'll accept anything. So this is a good example. I reviewed a grant the other day and I gave it a score of 2.5. And they said to me, wait, you're not allowed to use decimal points. I said, you gave me a form with a blank box, I'll put whatever I want in there. So, but, so we see the same thing in electronic health record. If somebody has an empty white box, they're gonna type something rather than giving them a drop down menu. So cleaning up that data is really hard. And then there's what we call the unstructured data, which is the free text. And so, the, um, you, so like the somebody, is somebody a smoker? How do you determine if somebody's a smoker? Ideally, you'd have a checkbox in Epic that would say patient's a smoker. Well, we don't have that. What we have is somebody that dictates, uh, patient smoked for 10 years, and then she quit, and then she's been trying for the last six months on and off at smoking cessation programs, uh, and she has been uh, you know, trying for the last five days, hasn't had a cigarette. Okay, that's free text. Has the pa is the patient a smoker? Uh, and, and this is a really tough question to answer, which goes back to natural language processing and sentiment analysis. Uh, I think the, the question of, of clean data is really important. Uh, the, the data profiling is the most important first step in any of these experiments. And anybody that comes to me and says, don't worry about the data cleanup, we'll take care of that, I always second guess that person. So that's a great question. Yep. When you have opaque, we have opaque algorithms sort of working on, on data, there's a lot of sort of early steering that you do yep. in these things can have long-term implications and sort of trying to understand where the conscious or unconscious human biases yeah, come great. in and how they, you know, can have lasting effects you just don't understand. Yeah, it's a great question. And it's not a, it's not a new problem, right? When you look, when you look at the, the growth charts for babies, for instance, you know, that show like if somebody's the fifth percentile. I mean, those were you know, uh, you know, white male babies from the 50s that they measured for these charts. So the idea of having bias in a measurement and having to um, having to compensate for that is nothing new. But now it's amplified, right? So if you have a cardiac arrest algorithm that's trained on the south side of Chicago. Uh, you now have an algorithm that's highly trained for University of Chicago patients that if you take it up to Northwestern may not work as well. You may have an unconscious bias toward the patient population we take care of here. And likewise, and probably more often, you're going to have algorithms that are trained on a more privileged, uh, a privileged group that may not work in other groups. And I think that's a real important distinction. And before we generalize these algorithms and say that they should be rolled out, this, this, uh, they need to be validated in many different uh, study populations. Uh, these are, this type of um, ethical, algorithms, um, ethical algorithms is something that uh, we think a lot about. The other guy that wrote that HBR piece with me, Andrew Burt, his specialty is ethical algorithms. And so I've, I've learned a lot from reading his pieces. And uh, he actually came and gave a talk that uh, Graham sponsored um, a month ago uh, and talked about these same issues. So it's really important. Uh, and just like, the, just like the legal framework, we need to have this at the, at the front of our minds as we do this. Um, so in the back there. Um, just a quick question. So you talk about the outlook that you have in the future of AI and medicine, and you s seem to have like a view of empowerment, how we're going to have a lot more freedom and a lot more control. Um, to me, this seems like there might be a little bit of tension between that and the way that some of these algorithms might work and the way that essentially it's kind of an optimization problem and there, there are ways that you can just minimize the uh, risk of disease um, that may infringe upon um, kind of that freedom and that control that we have. So how do you personally go about dealing with that tension? And do you think that like there is a point of optimization that is worth kind of giving up on um, for the sake of control? Like how do you approach that from an ethical standpoint? 
Yeah, so what I think you're asking is that um, if we overtrain the algorithms too far, we won't, they'll be too specific and we'll be losing out on other information. If we undertrain them, then they won't be any good. Um, and, and, and this is, I, I talked about this a little bit. I think, um, I think we need to give people the choice when they're presented with these results to understand what they mean. And so, for instance, if, if you, um, let's say you're diagnosed with, a, you're, you're recently diagnosed with cancer, and the physician says to you, the clinician comes up and says, listen, we put all of your genomic data and your clinical data into this algorithm, and it says you need to have rituximab. And, uh, and, and the physician says, you know, the most recent studies would suggest that rituximab is not the best drug here. Think back to that Go game, right? And the, but the computer says, based on what the computer knows, you should have rituximab as your next drug. I think you as the patient have the right to say, I don't want to have rituximab. I want to have some other medication. Uh, if you can't explain to me the rules underneath why I need rituximab, I have the right to not have to take that drug. And I want the standard of care, which is going to be cytoxan or something. Uh, and you have the right to ask for that. I think the, the danger is, uh, and I, I think the tension is, um, what is the expectation, when do we reach that tipping point where we think the algorithms are so good that the expectation is that the clinician and patient will always choose what the algorithm says, even if they don't understand why? And I, I like to think we're a, a long ways off from that. Um, I, I saw a, a, a scale once I thought was pretty cool, which was um, on, on one end it was, um, you know, everything, only evidence-based medicine. I'm only going to take the medicine if the, if the evidence says it. On this end, it was the computer's going to tell me what to do. And I think there's a line that's going to start to move, and we're, we're somewhere in the middle now where, where the computers help us make decisions, and over time, they're going to be more and more helpful, and we're going to believe more and more what they say. I don't think we're ever going to get to a point where you're going to walk in, it's going to take your blood, and it's going to say, take rituximab. I think there's going to be, um, that, that tension is always going to be there, and it's a conversation between the physician and the patient. I don't know if I really totally answered your question, but I think that, to me, that's the tension that I see in, in, the, in the hospital. Right back there? Mm -hmm. more data. And is that Shorlin in the back? Okay, That's so the second, second question is easier. I'll take that first. Um, uh, yeah, so the Shoreland Hotel, which is this beautiful Art Deco hotel where, <laughs> where uh, Jim, Jimmy Hoffa apparently used to hang out, is uh, on uh, Lakeshore Drive. And it, um, uh, the Center for Research Informatics and the Center for Data Intensive Science, where the genomic data commons, were both moved over to the Shoreland for space considerations about two years ago. Uh, and, it's a, and, and the lobby is open to the public. It, it's like The Shining in there. It's this beautiful open lobby. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's really a cool, it's a cool we, uh, we're actually in the ballroom. So they took the ballroom and modified it. And I'll just tell one, one cute story. So we were, um, we were uh, giving a tour to the, to the Duchess Wa family. And uh, they were um, hearing about some of the work we were doing. And the, um, the senior, Mr. Duchess Wa, was in his, must be in his late 80s now, uh, at one point he said to me, you know, I was married in this building in 1942 or whatever. And uh, so I took him down to the ballroom where our, my computation center is now. And uh, he looked around and he's like, yeah, I was in this ballroom that I got married uh, seven or 60 years ago. So it was really, really a cool moment um, uh, to show him that, that area. It's a re really cool space you should look at. Now, your first question about the impediment to collecting data, um, the biggest impediment to collecting um, data is lack of standardization. So we have, uh, we still have in 2018 a lack of any standards between, between groups, a lack of interoperability. Uh, I deal with this mainly in, in the pediatric cancer space. Uh, the, you know, what, what somebody calls, uh, if you ask somebody to, um, to, to say what the stages are for a tumor in one state, it's going to be different than another state. Uh, even like, um, even like a uh, list of uh, race and ethnicity. So if you say, I want to collect uh, ethnicity on a patient, one hospital could have 10 choices in their drop down, another hospital could have 20. And then how do you then share the data if you've collected it this way? Uh, so uh, the, these, these systems are collecting tons of data, uh, but it's not, it's not standardized. And that's the hugest problem. So what people are doing now is, uh, it, this is backwards, but it's the way it's happening, is, is, is you have multiple hospitals collecting data. Somebody says, here's the standard, and all the hospitals are now transforming their data after it's been collected into some standard that we can share. So the current standard is called OMOP, for instance, is a standard we're all sharing on. Uh, what needs to happen is that the electronic health record companies need to all agree that the, we're going to use the standard when we collect the data in the first place so that we don't have to go through this, trans, this transformation process, which is making a lot of people rich right now, transforming the data. So. Uh, how much time do we have? Got about five minutes. Okay. Um, what do you know 
about, and what do you think about the all of us research great. project? So that comes right out of my last comment about standardization. So the all of us project is great. So we're going to collect data on tens of thousands of patients uh, in a way that's standardized and get it into a database where everybody can study it. I think it's a wonderful initiative. We've taken a leadership role here at University of Chicago because we have such a, a well-standardized data warehouse. Um, and what it's forcing people to do is forcing them to reckon this, uh, with this problem of standardization because every hospital that submits data has to have it in this standardized format. And so, for instance, for us, it's actually changing the way we practice our data warehouse because now we're going to start to keep our data warehouse in this recognized format so that we don't even have to transform it before we send it. We're going to collect it in that format. But I think it's a, it's a great initiative. I mean, a question about who can collect it? Yeah, so. Right, so we have many low tech ways of collecting great data. Uh, and so uh, there's uh, open source things like RedCap that can run on a low power um, iPad or a mobile device where, where, where many other countries could collect data where you could actually impose the standard and say, here are the data collection forms on your patients, collect the data. I would bet that the biggest impediment to those issues is political and not technical, as we see with most of these. Do you have a question? Sorry. Yes. people in charge in their countries who are actually thinking about how to build electronic health record systems in their countries. And so they've joined the class and learned a lot from not just us, but also from peers in um, countries where there's already systems set up. And so that's been one really huge advantage of that program. Yep. Hi, yes. So you talked You're a lot nice. about um, how laws are really going to be formed over the next five to 20 years in this area. And I'm wondering what you think about who has the responsibility to be kind of educating the general public about what all of this information means, um, especially given that, for example, the HIPAA law, which is meant to protect things, causes a lot of data barriers for people doing research um, or wanting to improve applications. Um, so yeah, in general, who will have this responsibility for educating yeah, it's the a great, public? great question. And you get at this concept of um, data literacy, and that's the idea that everybody understands um, how important the data are not only the data itself, but how we collect it, how we save it, how we protect it. Uh, and this is going to be, uh, this is going to be a culture change. I think that, if anything, the, the recent problems with Facebook show you that our overall data literacy is quite low, that, um, that we didn't really understand the implications of having all these data stored in that way. So I think the, the responsibility is, I mean, this is, it's, it's corny, but it's everybody's responsibility, right? That we all need to educate ourselves about about how to take care of data. Clinicians and, and um, healthcare workers, of course, are going to be tasked with making people understand what it is to be the agents of their own healthcare data. Uh, but no one's going to you know, teach somebody. Um, uh, people have to take it upon themselves to understand what the implications are of clicking yes. You can uh, you know, tweet bot. You can look at my Amazon search history, and you can tweet for me. And people need to think before they make some of these decisions. Uh, and, and I think as citizens, we all have to take some of this responsibility. That's not a great answer, but I think that's sort of what I'm thinking about. There was a question here. I always get curious about the potential for preventing systemic medical errors. Mm -hmm. Let's say, yeah. and the implications of uh, for medical liability. That would be another thing. Yeah. So um, part of this talk that I give used to start with like how many errors we make, and you know, 400,000 people a year, you know, die with some aspect of their of their issues being being related to medical errors. Uh, and there's some really cool ways to think about how this technology can help prevent uh, prevent errors. Uh, you know, in the simplest way, it's like. Um, don't give a drug to a patient who's allergic to that drug. And the early, early systems had these kinds of protections in place. But now it's these early warning systems for cardiac arrest. It's predicting which patients are going to decompensate, predicting which patients are going to uh, be readmitted to the hospital. Uh, this, this type of modeling inside a hospital I think is going to be really important. Uh, but also now we're going to start to see modeling outside the hospital. So um, if there's a crash on 294, 
what does that mean for my staffing in the emergency department, and how can I predict how to change the hospital to help, to help protect patients? Um, uh, liability, I think, is an interesting question because uh, as we begin to rely more and more on these algorithms to make decisions, at what point um, are we liable to follow those directives versus not follow their directives? And again, I think this is a legal issue that we have to tackle. But, but, we're, but it's definitely going gonna, gonna to be, it's going to transform our approach to safety and quality in the hospital um, as we use these data. So, unfortunately, we've uh, just come to the end of our time. Um, join me one more time, please, and thank you, Dr. Fultzkrieg. <laughs>